Good morning and welcome back to this class of the Academy. This is a class on the Creed, which began last week and we are continuing today with the first article. I'm really excited about this class um, and the, these next few classes that are upcoming where we are really going to be diving into scripture and offering that scriptural basis for our common confession of faith, which we call the Apostles' Creed. So before we begin and diving into our lesson for today, let us first turn to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for giving us your words, for giving us your people who have used their wisdom from you and in you to give us this creed, to guide us in the true faith, the true faith of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune God. Lord, we ask that you would use this time of study to reveal to us your truth, that you would open our hearts to your word, and that we would be able to understand and know you better through our time of study today. Lord, we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So a quick review. Um, as we know, the Apostles' Creed and really all creeds are like a ruler. Remember the ruler from last week it, where it keeps us straight. My, my own attempt at a straight line we found was not actually very straight. I strayed. But when we used the ruler to guide, uh, to guide our line, we were able to make that straight line and keep a very straight, strict rule. So the Apostles' Creed and all other creeds are really used to guide and keep us straight in faithful teaching and confession of the Christian faith. It also keeps us from straying away from the truth. It keeps us very focused and straight on, that, uh, on, the, on the beliefs that we hold. As we mature in faith, we are able to delve into deeper dogma and systematics of the Christian faith um, and theology. But, but when we're thinking about using the creed or learning the creed or knowing God better through the use of the creed, we want to keep it, um, when we're thinking of using it in apologetics or as a witness, we want to keep it tight. We want to keep it close to this rule and not start straying. And the creed is what helps us to do that. So when we're sharing Jesus, when we're sharing our faith uh, with people or the faith with people, we wanna go ahead and keep it right in line where the creed keeps us in that straight line uh, so that we are not straying off from what uh, God's word really truly teaches us. Martin Luther said that the creed teaches us to know God perfectly. Now the creed is not found in the Bible specifically as a creed saying, hello, new Christians, use this creed. It's not that. It is not found directly in the Bible, but it succinctly defines basic tenets that we believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. It is directly from scripture. So it's not in scripture, but it is directly from scripture. All of the uh, points made, all of the confessions that we make in the Apostles' Creed are taken directly from God's word, which we're gonna really get into in a couple seconds here. So um, there was a question that was brought up uh, after last week's class that someone had asked um, about the word Trinity or this claim of a triune God. And they, they said, the word Trinity is not in the Bible anywhere, not in any of the uh, biblical languages, not anywhere to be found. How can you support the, the basis of a triune God? How can we say that the Bible supports the teaching of a triune God? we will absolutely answer this question. I debated on whether or not we would talk about that question today, but I, I think that it would be a better idea for us to go through the articles, go through the first, second, and third articles over these next uh, several weeks, 
And then we will know what the creed and what scripture teaches us about the triune God, what it teaches us about confessing faith in the Trinity. And so we will be prepared and better able, all of us together, because we will have studied Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together, that then we will be able to look at that question together and have a very, very sound answer. Um, so we're going to just be patient and get there. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, whoever asked that question knows that it's not going by the wayside and that indeed it will be answered, um, but you get to go on the journey with us in answering. So uh, last week we also had a challenge that I gave to you to find scriptural support of the first article of the creed. Um, which, if you remember, creed uh, is from the Latin credo, which means I believe. So our creed is just stating our beliefs. So we had a challenge to find scriptural references to I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I hope that that was a really good opportunity for you to engage with God's word and that it strengthened the faith that God has already planted within you. So without uh, further ado, we are going to turn to that first article and into God's word. And I will tell you, this class has been so much fun to prepare for um, because I find myself searching through God's word and engaging with God's word in new ways um, and old ways and exciting ways. And it's so much fun. So I hope that you are having as much fun engaging with God's word um, in like the challenge that was presented last week and that, uh, that, that you'll find this opportunity of searching and seeking through God's word to be as enriching and, and, and fulfilling as, uh, as it should be and can be. So we're going to actually go to the small catechism. If you do not have a small catechism, we can get you one. A small catechism uh, was written by, or the small catechism was written by Martin Luther uh, to be taught in the household for parents to be able to teach their children basics of the Christian faith. So um, every confirmand, when they start confirmation, they get a small catechism. This is what we teach from uh, to those confirmands, and they are able to know uh, the, the Christian, the basic Christian foundations uh, through those confirmation classes, which are centered around the small catechism teachings. So if you need a small catechism and don't have one, or if you would like one and don't have one, please let me know and uh, we'll get you one. But uh, the other thing that this is really handy for, and I, I think I talked about this before, is that um, if you carry one of these in your briefcase or your purse or your pocket, it is an awesome, awesome tool for witnessing. I have given many, many, many small catechisms out over the years uh, because it comes up in conversation and it's a great way to share your faith, share the faith with uh, those who have questions, with those who uh, don't quite believe or are on that fence and wanting to know more, or for anyone who just wants to know God better and wants to know uh, more of the foundational truths of the Christian faith. So we are going to read from the small catechism with the first article where it says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth or creator of heaven and earth. So what does this mean? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. How do we know that this is a true statement from Scripture that we can claim, that we can confess, knowing that we are staying true and standing under God's word and the truth of his word? So 
Get your note paper out. We're going to start writing down some scripture uh, verses and we're going to start looking them up. We're going to start with, I believe in God. I believe in God. Let's first go to Genesis 15. That is the uh, first book in the Bible. So if you open it up and you get past the uh, little introduction stuff, you're going to find yourself in Genesis. Go to Genesis 15, verse 6. Let me find it. There it is. And this is in that covenantal story of God with Abram or Abraham as he becomes Verse 6 says, and he believed, that is Abraham, Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. So Abraham believed the Lord. He believed what the Lord was telling him. Let's go over to John 1. So this is the fourth gospel. It's the fourth book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to go to John 1. Verse 7. John 1, verse 7. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. Okay, so that was speaking of John the Baptist who came to testify about Christ, to testify about God so that people would believe. Let's go to Romans 10, verse 10. Romans 10. So we're going to go past John, and then we're going to find ourselves in the book of Acts. You go past the book of Acts, and you'll find yourselves in Romans. So Romans 10, verse 10. For one believes with the heart and is so justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. So something to remember with that verse and with all these verses, um, that verse in particular, some people like to turn that into a law that it's something that you have to do in order to be saved. You have to confess with your mouth. You have to believe in your heart. But then we wonder, do I believe enough in my heart? What if I don't have enough belief? And we find ourselves in a tailspin because we don't know if we're doing it right. But this is a promise because it talks about salvation. It talks about the one who is justified, who believes in the heart um, and or with the heart and who is confessing with the mouth. That person is saved. So we need to read this and hear it as a promise. Faith itself and belief is a gift from God. It's not a matter of choosing God. It's not making a choice for Jesus, but it's being moved and transformed by God's own spirit that we are responding to the call. I like to use the story of Nazar or Lazarus as an example. When Lazarus was in the tomb, he was dead. He was absolutely dead. He couldn't make any choice of any kind at all. And yet he was called to life by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the same with us in faith. In our sin, scripture tells us that we are dead, dead to sin and trespass. So we are not living. We are as dead as Lazarus was in the tomb, not able to choose, not able to do anything. But... At the call of Jesus, at the call of God, we are made alive. And that is the belief in the heart. That is the confession upon our lips. So we confess with our mouth that the Lord is God, that Jesus did save us, and we are saved. Not out of law, but out of promise. We are given that gift. We are given that life by God himself. Let's look at that Genesis 15 again. It says that he, that's Abraham, believed the Lord um, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. We're in Romans right now. So let's stick in Romans. We're going to go back, keeping this Genesis verse in mind. Let's go back to Romans 4. 
beginning in verse 1. It says that, uh, What then are we to say was gained by Abraham our ancestor according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. It was not anything that Abraham did that made him righteous. There were no works involved. It was nothing of Abraham's doing. It was God's promise that Abraham heard and he believed. And I like to uh, really hone in on that gift of faith, that gift. We are professing and confessing, I believe, but we believe because God has made it so. I know I get to be a stickler on that, but I think that we need to be sticklers on that because there's a lot of wonky stuff that gets circulated out there. And the more wonky things get, the more we trust and rely on ourselves and in ourselves. And we're nothing to trust or rely upon. We need to trust and rely everything upon God. So um, let's go over to Hebrews. This is a warning against unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3, uh, verse 7. So if you keep going to the right, you're going to go through all of Paul's letters. Um, and then you're going to find yourselves uh, at Hebrews. It's the first, first book that is not uh, Paul um, after you get into those letters. So Hebrews 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, or beginning in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors put me to the test, though they had seen my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, and I said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. As in my anger, I swore, they will not enter my rest. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. When we are called by God into faith, we can confess that we believe. And we can believe it in our hearts because it is God's doing. We do, not, we do want to pray that, uh, that we don't fall away from that. We do want to pray that our hearts would be transformed and that our loved ones, their hearts would be transformed and that they would be called into new life in God with us. So I believe, I think we've covered scripturally, um, I believe. We can all agree that this is covered scripturally, belief. In God, the uh, I, I believe in God, the Father. So now let's go to the Father. Let's go to um, Malachi chapter 2, verse 10. Oh, I'm still in the New Testament. We need to go into the Old Testament. And it is right after Zechariah. It's the last book of the Old Testament. Um, so if you find yourself in the Gospels, Go one book past to the left of Matthew and you'll find yourself in the Old Testament and you will be in Malachi. So Malachi chapter 2, verse 10, where it says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? So he's referring to God the Father. Have we not all one Father? Let's go back into the New Testament to the Gospel of John, verse 20. John is the fourth Gospel, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 20, verse 17. John 20, verse 17. The woman said to Peter, oh, uh, wait a second here. Do, 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 do. Maybe I'm in the wrong, oh, no, I'm in 18. I was going to say, that does not line up right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, okay, so... John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, 
Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. God the Father is Jesus' Father, is our Father, is Jesus' God, is our God, right? It is the same. So we are looking at God the Father. Um, Let's go keep going to the right past Paul's letters. We're going to go to 1 John. So you're going to go past Hebrews where we were. You're going to go past um, James and the Peters. You're going to find yourself after 2 Peter, you'll find yourself in 1 John. And we want to go to 1 John verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 where it says, see what the love, what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We are children of God. A child cannot be a child without a father. We all have fathers. I believe in God the Father. We are children of God. Let's keep in 1 John chapter 3, go down to verse 9, where it says, Those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin because they have been born of God. Again, we have that linkage of paternity, that we have been made children of God, that he, him, he abides in us. Um, and uh, if you think about all the greetings from Paul, so many of his letters begin with something to the effect of grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In the context of witnessing, there are a lot of people who don't have great relationships with their fathers. And the image of a father can be uh, not comforting. It can be downright painful. Uh, some fathers are, have abandoned their children. Some fathers have perhaps hurt their children. And so when we are talking about God the Father, it can conjure up scary images or uh, disturbing thoughts or feelings. And so we need to be aware of that and cognizant of that because it's hard to think about a father um, different than what our earthly father is. So we know as Christians that our father in heaven, God the father, is good and gracious and loving and wants good for us and wants good in our lives and wants us to be reconciled to him. As you're witnessing to someone, use scripture that gives that, uh, that account of who God is. We know who he is and we want to reassure others that God the Father indeed is loving, that he is not out to get us, he is not out to smite all, um, and that we can trust him, we can find comfort in him, and that he is always with us and loving us. So God the Father is not out to abandon us, will never abandon us. God the Father is not out to hurt us. We may be disciplined in life, and, uh, and that's not to say that God does mean things to us. He allows life to happen. Um, but we need to just make sure that we bring that sort of witness that God is good, uh, God the Father is gracious, and that he has us in his hands um, to people as we're witnessing. So I believe in God the Father, Almighty, let's go to Almighty. Let's go to um, Genesis 35. We are going to talk about the Almighty, the almightiness of God. Okay, this is the last bit of the article that we can get to, and then we're gonna keep on going next week. 
This time goes so fast, I tell you. Anyway, um, Genesis 35, verse 11. So it's the first book in the Bible. Genesis 35, verse 11. If I can find it. Do, 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 do. Uh, God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall spring from you. God is telling Abraham, or God is telling uh, Jacob, I'm sorry, I am Almighty. God is claiming himself to be Almighty. Let's go, and what he's going to do for Jacob and only someone who has power would be able to do that for Jacob. Let's go over to um, Isaiah. That's uh, Isaiah 40. That's going to be after uh, Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He does not grow faint. He never gets weary. He has the power. He is almighty where he can continue to go. He is not like you and I in that we have to take breaks. Often, we are not mighty enough to sustain ourselves or to sustain anything without uh, growing tired and without needing that rest and needing that time to rest. So the Lord is everlasting and he keeps going. He never gets faint. He never gets weary. He has all that power, all that might. Let's go over to Luke 1. So we're going back to the... Uh, uh, New Testament, the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third Gospel, Luke chapter 1, verse 37, where there's a question about um, Elizabeth, who is barren. She's in her old age, and she didn't think she was going to have a son. And, uh, and then she's told that, that, or Mary is told that Elizabeth is going to have a baby, and the angel of the Lord says, nothing will be impossible with God. God is almighty. There is nothing impossible with God or for God. Someone recently gave me uh, a sweet little uh, gift that says, impossible is God's starting point. He is almighty and he is all powerful and he rules over all. So there's nothing that he cannot do. Let's go over to Revelation that's the last book in the Bible, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Again, he is claiming his might. He is claiming his almightiness. That is directly in scripture. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. He, he claims himself as almighty. Almighty means the ruler of all. And if you think about um, Job, and since we're running out of time, we're going to just talk about this, but I encourage you to look up Job chapters 38 through 41. Job has been questioning God or saying he wants to question God. And God responds to Job in those chapters. And he responds to Job with questions of his own. And he says, if you can answer my questions, I'll answer yours, right? He's, he's saying, gird your loins, dude, we're going to have a talk. And so he responds with his own questions to Job. And in those questions, in chapters 38 through 41 of Job, there are details of the intricacies of creation that only the Almighty could know about the weather, about creatures, about why the dove coos, about why the deer lays with its young. It, it, it's incredible, all of the intricate 
uh, facts and thoughts of uh, creation that only the Almighty could know, only the ruler of all could know. Um, again, that Hebrews verse that we had read that um, we're not to test the Lord as to his power. He is almighty, all powerful, ruler of all, and it is not our job to test him. Which brings up, and this is the last story we're going to talk about here for today's class. Um, 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 through 40. This is where Elijah uh, is, is in battle with the priests of the false god Baal. And they are going to have sacrifices um, and, and have these fires, these sacrificial fires. And read the, read the text. It's, it's 1 Kings 18, 20 through 40, where Elijah, um, all of the priests of Baal have these sacrifices and they're chanting, um, wanting rain to come, uh, wanting Baal to prove himself, and nothing happens, nothing happens at all. And uh, Elijah then has his wood, his kindling, um, water poured on it, and the fire is struck up. Oh, that's what it was. I'm sorry, I misspoke a little bit. So the fire was supposed to be struck up, and, uh, and the priests of Baal were dancing around, wanting this fire to, to strike up, and it doesn't happen. And Elijah is telling uh, them to wet his fire, and he speaks to the Lord, and the Lord makes it happen. And it's this interesting battle, but nothing is impossible with God. He is almighty. He is ruler of all. We need to trust that. We have story after story after story, verse after verse after verse, that proves God's almightiness, his powerfulness. So to say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, can be proven in many ways through Scripture. It is directly from Scripture and not just one little verse, not just one little place. We could go. I had to take verses out because <laughs> we run too long. Um, it's incredible how rich and thick the Bible is for every single one of these belief statements. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Next week, we are going to talk about God as the creator of heaven and earth. These classes go so quickly. I hope that you will, again, take time this week to engage with God's word in finding how he is and how it is proven through scripture that he indeed is the creator of heaven and earth. Until then, uh, have a wonderful week and let us close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, for the abundance of proof, scriptural proof that you are who you say you are. You are indeed our father. You are indeed the one who allows us to believe and you are the almighty. We thank you, Lord, for this word that is upon our lips. We ask that you would continue to reveal your truth to us throughout this week as we seek to learn you, learn more about you, and to know you better every day. All of this we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week, and I'll see you next Sunday.